lecture and uh, uh, we uh, in the previous lecture we discussed the general ideas of modernism uh, and the reason why uh, there is a there is a breaking away from tradition and uh, all that it was more of a discussion and less of a lecture so uh, then in the next class in the in the afternoon class we discussed T.S. Eliot's essay called Tradition and Individual Talent. And uh, in that, he says that uh, he gives a lot of traditions, uh, allusions to a lot of uh, other texts from other uh, Eastern and Western philosophy and other established writers. And he, and he does that uh, to make a point that uh, you should know your tradition. As in, when you write about something, you should be aware that there are a lot of other people who've already written about the same thing before you. And this he calls historical awareness or historical sense. Uh, and the other people have written about it and they've done a better job at it than you are doing. So uh, he is attacking you on the individual genius of, uh, of, a, of an artist that the romantics upheld. And he says that this individual sensibility is the mere catalyst in the process of writing. Uh, and he says that the poem, I mean, the art and the, uh, yeah, the tradition and the art are both a dynamic relationship in the sense that when a writer writes something, he transforms the tradition even a little bit. And the tradition also transforms the art to some extent. And he was a conserva conservationist, and he an extreme conservationist. He was against conservation. Was conservative. Okay. Uh, there's a difference between conservationist and conservative. Yes. Conservative is a person who supports a kind of traditional conventional morality uh, as against radical. And conservationist is a person who is into the business of conserving. Yes. Manuscripts or monuments. Yes. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, yes. So he was a conservative in his ideologies, and he obviously did not support democracy. Uh, and he said he uh, attacks the romantic idea of uh, of expression of personality in poetry. And he in fact says that uh, poetry is so it is it is impersonal and it, this again alludes back to his point that it, it is an, uh, the individual talent is a catalyst in this uh, creative process uh, and then he upholds uh, the metaphysical poets and he says that these people i mean the metaphysical poets were not recognized uh, before i think uh, uh, before uh, the, he talks about dissociated sensibility and associated sensibility. Dissoci um, yeah, dissociation of sensibility and association of association sensibility. Association of sensibility, yes. Yeah. So he says that after separate, uh, separation, after Milton, there is a separation between the emotional aspect and the intelligence of the poet. Um, but before this, separation did not exist, and that was uh, association of sensibility. This after Milton, we have this dissociation of sensi sensibility. And uh, uh, so this idea of the head and the heart, uh, which was separated after Milton's time, that comes together in the metaphysical poetry. And uh, so uh, that saying that he upholds these poems uh, and the, the poets as well. And he brings back this uh, metaphysical trends in the modern era since he was obviously inspired by that because again they provide an intellectual and emotional competency to the work and uh, he keeps on revisiting the older works uh, i mean already the, the uh, already established works then we talked about his essay on uh, uh, james joyce uh, and then he gives the examples from Odysseus. Then, then we talked about the shift from the outside world to the inside world. So that's something we talked about. Next, he suggests that facts 
are greater than opinion they hold a greater value than opinions again in this sense we see that he is attacking the idea of subjectivity that we find in romanticism and reading a there's always a difference between the um, man who is writing and the man i forget the word words that you used but the uh, man who suffers and man uh, who writes yes Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. That the man who suffers and the man who writes are uh, two different things. And in in this process of if you write subjective poetry, what happens is that we took this example of being sad. If a person writes that I'm sad, that may or may not uh, may or may not be congruent with the with the emotion and feeling of the person who's reading it at that moment. so this is something and this does not make the literature or the art relatable and hence is that this he disapproves of and this kind of what, what is it that he disapproves of direct direct uh, uh, expressing of emotions instead he uses this idea of objective correlative right. in the uh, in the sense that he suggests that subjectivity hampers the communication between uh the creator and the perceiver so to, to kind of create a uh kind, kind of create a universal idea of uh, what he wants what the creator wants to communicate we have to build this objective correlative between the uh creator and the perceiver and this uh, for this he uses a dramatic monologue in so many of his poems that we discussed this that we discussed and um, this dramatic monologue sort of gives the uh, the poet a mask from which he he or she can talk so that uh, so that it is uh, it is understood by the reader um, yes then he talks about uh, individual uh, invisible individuality in poems that uh, again acts as a catalyst in all of that like uh, your individuality should be invisible and they should it should speak through the tradition and it should be a mere catalyst in uh, and those people who do not ha- who have a personality can uh, can be impersonal in their poems which is yeah, so what yeah what is that the phrase do you remember uh, the sentence poetry is not turning loose of emotions but poetry is an escape from emotions right yes. and poetry is not an expression of personality but escape from personality yes and this i thought was a very sharp uh, jive at the romantics like right i'll try to call them having no personality which is yeah, yeah. So. so he uses yeah so about uh, the objective correlative there is a use of symbols <coughs> and all of that in uh, objective correlative method so that is used to convey the meaning uh, in a sort of a universal way so that is all i remember yeah yeah very good only small correction uh, that he talks about multiple text and allusion not in his essay tradition and individual talent but as a as a mode of his writing uh, so, yes in his general poems yeah. yes yeah that is the method that he adopts and why does he adopt that to emphasize his point that uh, tradition should not be cut off from and uh, your individual talent is a mere uh, you know it doesn't amount to the in, to the traditions that are that are already established right very good so you can see that he is in some way uh, uh, putting himself up setting himself up against romantic poetics and even politics right so romantic poetics are based on self expression subjectivity emotions uh uh and individual distinct personality of a writer uh, which is in the form of genius and uh, underlying idea is the idea of individuality right and also the emphasis on emotions uh, instead of intellect is also something that uh, romanticism according to him suffers from and in order to bring back intellect into uh, poetics right he evokes this whole idea of association of sensibility that you find in uh, metaphysical poets right and that is that comes in his essay called metaphysical poets 
and uh, then he also talks about if you remember uh, how this is in con modern age is a complex age right given the complexity and anarchy of our times we cannot write simplistic stuff so intellectual and emotional complexity is what modern literature should try to uh, uh, articulate so T.S. Eliot is doing it from a modernist perspective. He is offering a critique of romanticism because it is an established dominant poetics of Victorian period, entire 19th century. So even if we see that in fiction you have realism, poetry is still dominated by romantic poetics. So instead of expression of your individuality and genius he emphasizes uh, tradition historical sense and impersonality right historical sense is your awareness of the entire tradition and he says that tradition is never uh, it never comes to us on a platter you have to earn it that is also another uh, statement that he makes which again goes against the romantic aesthetics of uh, spontaneity right so he is evoking a new kind of classicism right which is not based on mimesis but a kind of critique of uh, romanticism and uh, modernist aesthetics of Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot were very often classicist in that sense uh, but they are, this new form of classicism is in the context of modern period that is what you have to understand. That's why it is modernism. Because why is it modernism? Because it insists that uh, modern times are different from the earlier times. And therefore, modern literature has to be different from earlier literature. Not just that, modern poetics also must be different from the traditional poetics. Right? And as you pointed out, the idea of objective or relative and it comes in his essay on Hamlet, right? And that is also a kind of critique of romanticism, which talks about expression of your subjectivity. So Hamlet is an artistic failure for uh, Eliot because it does not come up with very uh, powerful objective correlatives. That's his idea. And this uh, whole idea of objective correlatives owes its something to symbolism as well. Where if you remember, uh, Malarme is saying that a language itself is a kind of uh, language speaks, right? And it, speak, it articulates itself through symbols. So it's not poet who is articulating his emotions, but it's a language which is doing all the talking. So you find this theory of impersonality in Malarme as well. All right. So anything that you have to ask about this? You had a question as well, right? I think. Yes, I did. I was... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so before that, I would like to add a point that I realized I missed out. Okay. Uh, he, he talks about uh, criticism. So criticism mm -hmm. should be uh, a discussion of facts, as I have already pointed out, and yeah, yeah. Should be disinterested, as mm. unbiasedness should be there in criticism. And then he talks about uh, <laughs> and correction of taste, as in yes. high, or low, high literature and lower literature. It is, and, uh, the, the function of criticism, that is a famous essay yes. by T.S. Eliot, which says yes. that criticism is about elucidation of works of art and correction of taste. Elucidation means uh, the job of criticism is to e e explain uh, literary works. And correction of taste means you have to point out which is good literature and bad literature. And this is what actually connects him to Matthew Arnold as well, right? Yeah, uh, right, very good. So. I had a question about uh, Eliot himself. Uh, so we have discussed modernism as uh, a period where we were breaking away from traditions. And as a sharp contrast to that, 
Elliot emphasizes on bringing up traditions back again. So how is he a modernist writer then? Uh, he is attacking traditional poetics. And those poetics were romantic poetics. Right, right up to even Oscar Wilde as a poet or whoever uh, before Eliot. Uh, if you look at, and that trend continues in England in uh, Georgian poetry as well uh, in 20th century. But romantic lyric, right, becomes the predominant mode of poetic expression where the speaker is, the subjectivity of speaker is the theme or is the core of uh, romantic poetics, right, and that expressive theory of poetry, which was itself a kind of critique of uh, neoclassical poetics based on scholarship, right. So, according to Eliot, that is uh, not that won't do for an age that is as complex as modern age. So, you cannot afford to be unintellectual in your poetry. So poetry is not all about heart. Daffodils and nightingales and larks and skylarks and and uh, uh, and beautiful uh, lake district, right? All that uh, uh, kind of uh, romanticism about uh, uh, expression of individual subjectivity is no longer uh, possible in an age that is intellectually as well as emotionally complex. That's his argument. At the same time, he is talking about historical sense that the whole romantic idea of uh, just writing whatever you feel does not hold uh, because uh, that comes from a place like a uh, uh, breakup that is poetry, right? So, but then you are not aware that thousands of other people have experienced similar states in their life and have probably written better than you. So that kind of ignorance-based poetry, intellectual ignorance-based poetry is something that he's attacking. So his revival of tradition is uh, a kind of revision of tradition as well. Right. So modernism is always a break with past, but also break uh, break with traditional view of tradition. I'm not sure whether I'm communicating. Instead of traditional view of tradition, you have a modern modernist view of tradition. So you see tradition in a different light, something that is relevant to you, like he saw. Uh, uh, metaphysical poets as being more important than Milton or Romantics, right? So his revaluation and revision of tradition is uh, a very important thing to be kept in mind. By modernism, you don't mean that you forget your past, right? You rethink your past in that sense. It is a break. So you are also rejecting the immediate past of uh, uh, romantic poetics, but also you are revising your perception of history and tradition. So tradition becomes one of the most important idea in modernism. How does that sound? Right, and uh, he, in his famous essay, Tradition and Individual Talent, he says that tradition was spoken of in a very negative way uh, in England very often. He bought traditional, but it's time to rethink what is tradition. And excessive importance was given to individual talent. So he defines individual talent not as uh, ignorance of tradition, but a revision of tradition. So when a new writer writes, he is also changing the perception of past, just as your historical sense is changing your perception of the present. And uh, he talks about not imitating the past, right? If you are going to repeat what uh, Matthew Arnold or Swinburne used to write, have you heard of a poet called Swinburne or Robert Browning or uh, 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 other Victorian poets like Matthew Arnold? If you are going to keep on writing in that vein, that is not uh, 
tradition that is uh, imitation and that kind of uh, poetry is useless so he is revising the uh, relation between tradition and individual talent by saying that tradition is not just something to be imitated but imbibed right critically imbibed historically imbibed and that is a work of uh, labor jaldi does that help you to understand your question is very interesting that's why yes sir it does uh, right so it's revision of tradition and uh, he goes on to emphasize that all critical writing all creative writing involves criticism right and he says that criticism is as inevitable as breathing that's what he says so any poet who writes is critically evaluating material so the whole romantic aesthetics which saw criticism as a parasitical activity right he is like matthew arnold again so his ideas own a lot be of ideas to matthew arnold as well so who who he is critiquing right so criticism is in as inevitable as breathing and all good poetry is a product of critical labor how does that sound yeah jaldi so what were you saying yes sir so that is sorted i understood what uh, you just just said uh, and i understood the difference but then that i had one more question that just arose right now that uh, before this since we are talking about the classical view of uh, looking at poetry now we know that in classical sense poetry is supposed to have a function or the moral function as we have yeah. always yeah. discussed Mm-hmm. and uh, in the romantic era uh, this was kind of oscar wilde and uh, baudelaire and all those people did uphold okay. these ideas of uh, poetry having a moral function so how does eliot look upon uh, this because if we look at this thing uh, this poem called love song of alfred prufrock or the wasteland those are the only two poems i'm referring to mm-hmm. right now i do not see like it an overt moral mm. i may be wrong but yeah actually again uh i'm not very sure he evokes this paradigm of pleasure and instruction any longer that poetry has to either be about pleasure or about didactic kind of thing right so those morals are almost absent in his uh, main critical writing at least right that is also very strange what is the function of poetry he never chalks out he has written about function of criticism right so for some reasons this whole dichotomy between pleasure and uh, delight versus instruction is somehow displaced he never talks about it in those terms and i feel that the reason is probably the modernism uh, also laid a lot of emphasis on urban despair and negativity right as in baudelaire so pleasure idea of aesthetic pleasure also seems to be uh, i think now changing with eliot its pleasure is not just as something that you get after watching the daffodils or nightingales sing right so pleasure would also mean something like a sense of uh, aridity in wasteland so i think modernist aesthetics uh, in some way uh, does away with this whole uh, uh, delight versus you uh, delight versus uh, instruction debate so i think in some way it is uh, uh, aestheticism and formalism again but a broadened idea of aesthetics for sure but it's a very interesting question i think you can ext- you will have to look deeper into his criticism to get your answer but it's a very important interesting answer but 
that debate seems to be on decline yes sir exactly because before yeah. this, uh, it was quite clear ki before right before this there was an avid discussion about uh, uh, the person of and then achanak se nothing so it's achanak se aise nahi hoga uh, it's more it like uh, it doesn't remain relevant probably any longer uh, that's what it seems to me uh, yes so uh, that is that right any other question anyone else as yes go ahead if anyone else has a question जीरो क्वेश्चंस थे सब जीनियस लोग है यार आप लोग रोमांटिक जीनियस हो सब लोग किसी को डाउट बेचारी जल्दी को ही सब प्रॉब्लम्स होते रहते हैं दूसरे लोग तो जीनियस है क्या हुआ जल्दी हाउ कम यू हैव ऑल द प्रॉब्लम्स एंड नो वन एल्स हैज आई डोंट नो सर को प्रॉब्लम सोचे रहते थे आज पता नहीं क्यों सब समझ में आ गया पूजा को है शायद क्या पूजा पूजा चयन Saloni, but what about others? Tanvi, Shivangi, Vedika, Jessi, Mansi, Krishna, Tarina, Kavya, Komal. No doubts. Okay, if you have any doubts, then we will move on. आरुषा अभिजीत अस्मा क्रिकेटर हु एवर ही और शी इज रिश्मा इफ यू डोंट हैव डाउट्स विल मूव अहेड शाल वी इतना सन्नाटा क्यों हो गया है लास्ट में you know how i sir, look at I class look at yeah go ahead sir i have to look at the previous lecture because i think the one that i attended we just discussed and the second lecture had all the information about iliad about iliad yeah it was primarily about iliad okay yes so never and mind I, if you have any doubts you can ask later as well but from today's conversation uh, i think uh, jaldi gave you a very uh, good overview yes. of the whole thing. so yes, in that sir. Do you have any question regarding that? No, sir. I have to go back to that lecture because I have studied the text of Habib, and I think okay. in that the content is very less. Very Habib less. Eliot. Exactly. And Eliot is such a big name, right? And uh, Eliot, uh, and including I, Richards, if you see, which I am going to discuss, and the whole Cambridge school. He is something that he has completely glossed over. Now, that may be his personal view of things to give more emphasis. And usually, writers also have to face uh, limitations of pages. Yeah, बहुत पेज ज़्यादा होता publisher won't accept. As a writer, I know, right? Uh, but as a student, what happens is that Eliot, new criticism. Uh, and the Cambridge School get lots of importance in entrance tests after your graduation. That's why I extensively discussed uh, Eliot. Right now, 
यू मे बी थिंकिंग एग्जाम में क्या आएगा ना एग्जाम में जो हबीब में नहीं है ना वो नहीं आएगा राइट right? पर ये इस एग्जाम की बात हुई एंट्रेंस एग्जाम्स जो बाहर होंगे वहां पे ये सब आ सकता है एम आई मेकिंग माई सेल्फ क्लियर यस सो वन ऑफ द स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ दिस बुक is that it lays great emphasis on the historical context which helps us to understand the evolution or shifts or developments of ideas in the west right so it's a brilliant book in that sense that it offers a lucid kind of overview of main critics very complex uh, theories and ideas it offers very lucid overview in a historical context now that is the strength of this book but weakness if you ask me is this missing names like uh, i richards and fr lewis right that is the limitation and ben johnson as someone else was saying right that there is no hardly any discussion on ben johnson as a critic i would also say shelley is such a huge name influential name as a critic uh, that is not given much importance so anyway so important names are missing or given less emphasis as psl here but that is fine and uh, i am trying to rectify that limitation right if i were habib i would not spend so much time on plotiness right i would give more space to apartheid which is more contemporary and relevant to us uh i would have kept talking us brief right okay so let's proceed yeah so ps elliot is considered to be one of the precursors of a school called new criticism and uh, uh, new criticism is an american school Uh, from say for example somewhere between 1900 uh, 20s to 1960s wo 40 saal ek bahut hegemonic bahut hi predominant school rahi american ki and every literary movement after 60s is a critique or rejection of new criticism right so new criticism is not to be confused with the latest criticism but actually an old school of criticism old 20th century so other precursors of new criticism along with ts eliot uh, who was not very appreciative of uh, uh, new criticism right he used the term lemon squeezer school of criticism to discuss new criticism लेमन नींबू को निचोड़ निचोड़ के जितना मीनिंग निकल सकता है पोएम में से वो सब निचोड़ते हैं वो इसलिए उसे ही इज नॉट वेरी फॉन्ड ऑफ दैट बट ही इज कंसिडर्ड वन ऑफ द प्रिकर्सर्स राइट अदर प्रिकर्सर इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट नेम कॉल्ड आई रिचर्ड्स एंड आई रिचर्ड्स इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर मल्टीपल रीजन वन he brings some uh important notions of psychology and linguistics in analysis of literature and uh, he belong he is cambridge school right now, while t s eliot is a poet from america who has settled down in england and uh, i richards however is uh a uh, kind of psychologist and semantic and a uh, linguist who is looking at developing a model for analysis of poetry texts specific texts and the methodology that he calls practical criticism has become almost central to pedagogy of literature that means for several decades uh, his method of analysis of text became prominent something called close reading of uh, text 
and it came from his own experience as a teacher so what connects i richards with matthew arnold is the whole concern for classroom pedagogy and method uh and education and criticism seems to move hand in glove with uh, uh i richards and i richards marks another important shift in english studies after matthew arnold right so while matthew arnold is providing a kind of a justification for inclusion of english literature in universities and colleges laying down functions of literature has a kind of ideological agenda which is marked by elitism right where a particular section of industrialized middle class is trying to assert its sub cultural superiority over working class and lower sections of middle class in that superiority is through uh, embodiment of certain aristocratic values of culture right so the notion of culture becomes central to matthew arnold it's an elitist it is uh, and if you remember for him culture is inner development right inner internal perfection it's a study of perfection and in order to counter the materialism and utilitarianism of the class in which he is living he introducing he introduces lit, literary studies and criticism as promoting culture in a society that is slowly losing out on culture according to him and that is happened because religion has been slowly displaced by science and developments in scientific technology and materialism of the times right so this elitist notion of culture also finds a kind of equivalent in ts eliot's idea of tradition right and his whole thing whole idea of function of criticism as elucidation of works of art and correction of taste right indicates a split between high art and low art high art or high literature is that which has cultural significance while low art is working class entertainment right or it is uh, popular culture so popular and high literature is split with matthew arnold and ts eliot something that remains uh, the mod uh, the modernist paradigm of culture if you want to uh, understand it that way right so this becomes a mainstream and in fr lewis another uh, important cambridge scholar he puts culture and tradition at the center of his critical project and his critical project like i richards is bound up like matthew arnold as well with pedagogy right or education and syllabus so if you want to teach literature in colleges which text should you study which text will you prescribe is a very basic practical uh, question that even you may have to face if you become teachers right aap kya padhaoge aap salman rushdi padhaoge ya to kill a mocking bird padhaoge ya chetan bhagat aur durjay datta padhaoge ya aap twilight padhaoge हैरी पॉटर पढ़ाओगे या इटालो कैलविनो पढ़ाओगे कुंडेरा पढ़ाओगे क्या राइट सो टुमोरो इफ यू बिकम टीचर्स देन यू विल हैव दिस प्रैक्टिकल क्वेश्चन स्टेयरिंग एट योर फेस एंड टू फॉर यू टू से दैट सलमान रशदी इज सुपीरियर टू चेतन भगत देन यू विल हैव टू जस्टिफाई राइट सो द होल टच स्टोन मेथड दैट मैथ्यू आनंद हैड Uh, formulated was a kind of uh, method created to uh, justify a kind of elitist canon in college and universities right something that becomes prominent part of fr lewis project 
So I. Richards and F. R. Lewis are two of very prominent Cambridge scholars, right? I. Richards emphasis is on actual classroom teaching of poetry. And uh, in a very famous uh, experiment, he distributed unseen poems to his students, right? Without telling who the poet was. And he asked their responses. And students gave all sorts of impressionistic responses. Which disappointed him, right? And this kind of uh, arbitrariness in interpretation was something that bothered him. So his own cultural uh, and critical project was to come up with a methodology of analysis, systemic analysis of poetry, systematic analysis of poetry. And Excuse me, sir. Uh, yeah. Sir, uh, what did he not like about the whole? The, the arbitrariness and randomness of uh, interpretations and impressions. So he handed out poems uh, uh, of unknown poet to his classroom. And all of them gave kind of uh, that kind of uh, uh, impressionistic uh, subjective responses were uh, something that disappointed him. And that's why he felt the need to create a kind of scientific methodology for analysis of literary and poetic texts. Is that clear, Chen? Yes, sir. Yes. So suppose I give you a poem uh, and you give me some interpretation and then I tell you, Are, toh, words work ne likhi hai. Aap immediately usme nature, nature, dhunna, bad jau, right? Yeah, na? So how yes, yes. Uh, uh, biases creep in. So he wants to develop an objective method of analysis and interpretation of work that becomes one of the core ideals of new criticism later on. Remember, uh, I.A. Richards is British scholar primarily uh, who went to Harvard later on America. But uh, early part he's associated with Cambridge, right? And uh, he, he applied linguistics and psychology as a scientific tools for interpretation and analysis of literature. That is a very important move that he makes. So if you see criticism till now, right, right from Plato to uh, T.S. Eliot, including Matthew Arnold, including uh, Johnson, including Dryden, Pope, nobody has used tools from social sciences, right? In analysis of texts, uh, especially linguistics, especially psychology, right? So uh, this intervention that uh, F, uh, I. Richards made is one of the earliest uh, examples of uh, interdisciplinarity in modern sense of word, and this is the beginning of theory, right? So literary theory starts coming into existence, which is interdisciplinary, which draws upon social sciences like uh, psychology and uh, linguistics. And uh, he points out using in his very important book called Principles of Literary Criticism, 1924. Right. So we are looking at post World War uh, scenario. Principles of Literary Criticism, right? You can see the title of the book itself. And his second book, which appeared five years later, is Practical Criticism. And Practical Criticism is also one of the uh, 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 courses that we offer at a, a master's degree, which means you are using the theories and ideas in analysis of specific actual text. Unlike literary criticism and theory, where you listen to all sorts of uh, ideas, like in this current course from past semester, you are using these ideas in analysis of a specific text. And 
that is called practical criticism is that clear what is practical criticism so a uh, theoretical and practical just a uh, difference so something like applied criticism as ho sakta hai so you may think of uh, mathematics and applied mathematics uh and pure physics and applied physics pure chemistry and applied chemistry right so pure ye jagah aap theoretical keh sakte ho theoretical criticism and applied criticism so application part is uh, the most important part of practical criticism right and what uh, separates practical criticism from theoretical is analysis of a specific text at great uh, length is that understood difference between theoretical and practical so theoretical theory comes from the word theoria that means dekhna practice come from the word praxis yani karna right so theory is more about viewing having asking larger questions like what is the function of literature in society or how does society influence literature or how does literature influence society or you are trying to define what is literature all these questions are part of theoretical questions right what is literature what does it do how is it impacted by society how does it uh, affect the reader what does reader do while analyzing literature these abstract general questions are in the domain of theory practical questions would go like what does this image mean or what why has poet used this phrase and not that why has poet uh use this form and not that form why does novelist use this kind of description and not that so you are asking specific questions to a specific text is that clear any questions now both these domains draw upon each other in order to define what is literature you will have to analyze specific literary text right and that is called hermeneutic cycle by some scholars आप लिटरेचर को डिफाइन करने के लिए आप लिटरेचर देखते हो तो प्रॉब्लम ये होता है कि आपने पहले से ही आपको पता है लिटरेचर क्या है इसीलिए आप लिटरेचर डिफाइन करने के लिए लिटरेचर पढ़ते हो एम आई मेकिंग एनी सेंस दैट इज द पैराडॉक्स इंटरप्रिटेटिव पैराडॉक्स एज इट इज कॉल्ड सो डेफिनेशन ऑफ लिटरेचर इट्स फंक्शन Uh, all this falls under the domain of theoretical criticism practical criticism is analysis of specific poem so what you were doing in your first year paper for one was you were analyzing specific texts like right? uh, who is coy mistress or uh, uh, my last duchess and we i don't know if you remember i ask you why is it last duchess why is it if it is my लास्ट डचेस तो ये किसकी डचेस है रॉबर्ट ब्राउनिंग ने कब डचेस के साथ शादी की थी ऐसे सब कॉन्वर्जेशन याद है आपको किसी को फर्स्ट ईयर पांच हजार साल पहले जब इजिप्ट में पिरामिड बन रहे थे तब हमने ये डिस्कशन किया था याद है किसी को यस चैन को याद है right so those questions are the questions of practical criticism so is the distinction between practical and theoretical clear any questions about this distinction uh, so sir the reading of poetry is always a practical criticism a specific poem a specific okay. if For we example, study poetry yeah, sonnet or whatever you are reading specific poem ke aap interpretative questions puchte ho to use practical criticism ke and theoretical we, you are talking about poetry in general what is poetry how is it different from prose what is the place of poetry in society 
uh, or what is the function of poetry or how is uh, poetry uh, influenced by society so ye jo general questions hai wo theoretical hai right yes sir understood right so he goes on to make very famously a distinction that would go into the heart of almost modern literary theory so 20th century literary ka dil hai right uh, almost up to 1960s at least jise formalism kehte hain uska basic distinction ye hai he makes a distinction between referential use of language and emotive use of language by arguing that language used in science technology prose newspaper is essentially referential its job is to provide information it it refers to the world around right for example this is a pen is a referential statement it refers to something but if i say this pen reminds me of my childhood right then that is an emotive statement where uh, the function of language is to evoke emotions ye pen mujhe uh, fifth standard mein mili thi jab mere sabse zyada marks aaye the baad mein uske baad mere kabhi bhi sabse zyada marks nahi aaye isliye maine ye abhi tak sambhal ke rakhi hai right that is a kind of emotive use of language or where it involves fictionality as well now actually mere fifth standard mein bhi kabhi highest nahi the right so the point i am making is that referential use of language and uh, uh, emotive use of language is two different use of language so literature and poetry does not language of literature and poetry does not function in the same way as a newspaper or as a uh, scientific report or a commercial brochure it functions to evoke emotions right so this distinction is the heart of formalism right so what you are actually saying and why is it formalism is that you are saying that the poetic of domain or poetic use of language is actually autonomous right this difference marks its distinction in society so place of literature and poetry is different from place of science arts technology commerce newspaper and so on and so forth so this marks of two domains domain of poetry and literature and domain of science technology commerce business and so on everyday use of language right so this distinction between referential and emotive indicates a formalist distinction it is formalist right and another reason why it is formalist is because emotive use of language is about form very often how you say things right so emotion is conveyed not by referring to something but also in your intonations in your expressions the paralinguistic things coming right uh, so distinction between poetic use of language and a language of uh, other discourses and you can see that uh, uh, plato seems to have confused one for another when he says that poetry does not reveal truth because it is twice or thrice removed from reality right he is confusing the language of philosophy with language of poetry right so philosophy is concerned primarily with referentiality and truth while poetry and literature is about emotionality ev evoking emotions and feelings anything that you have to say ask about this distinction 
I wandered as uh, a lonely cloud that floats high over vales and hills. And suddenly I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. He is not referring to any object so much as evoking the emotions that he felt, right? He's trying to uh, evoke emotional states rather than convey referential information about daffodils or lake hills. Is that clear? Yes, you have to ask a referential or emotive use of language. In his other book, he also goes on to state that equilibrium of conflicting instincts and emotions is what poetic poetry results in. It tries to balance uh, multiplicity of uh, emotional responses, right? So he uses terms like equilibrium of emotions and impulses. The poem strives to achieve that. And it's almost a kind of uh, uh, going back to Coleridge's definition of uh, uh, poetry as uh, reconciliation of, of opposites. Biography or literary, which we discussed discuss in 3,000 years ago. If Right? Uh, so that is what literature has a psychological dimension as well, emotional psychological dimension of achieving uh, equilibrium of uh, opposite impulses like good, bad, sad, happy, uh, desire, lack of desire, anger, calmness. Yes, sab jo conflicting desire, emotional states, hai, usme equilibrium is what a poem tries to achieve. And building on top of that, uh, his student uh, called William Empson wrote a very important treatise called Seven Types of Ambiguity. Ambiguity means lack of uh, logical clarity, right? Ambiguity means lack of rational clarity. Now, in philosophical discourse or in a journalistic discourse or in scientific discourse, ambiguity is seen as uh, a negative thing. It is bad. It is something that is to be done away with. Right? Philosophy or science or uh, journalism cannot afford ambiguity. However, building upon his teacher's idea of uh, referential and emotive, he says that ambiguity means lack of logical, rational meaning is a source of richness of a poem. A poem can be actually in, interpreted in conflicting ways, diverse ways, owing to this uh, feature called ambiguity. So poetic use of language is deliberately ambiguous. It deliberately does not say things clearly. Right. So one of the obstacles that utilitarian minded people have reading poetry is that they expect it to be clear and logical and rational. So that's why people shy away from poetry. Right. I don't know how many of you do that. irrational My heart leaps up when I see uh, rainbow in the sky. Right. So uh, the pragmatic utilitarian outlook does not appreciate poetry given its deeply ambiguous nature. So in his book, Seven Types of Ambiguity, he tries to distinguish between various kinds of ambiguity that you find in poetry in a poem. And he shows how each uh, type of ambiguity is actually adding to the richness 
of the work, making poetic text uh, uh, open to multiplicity of readings, right? Which can be contradictory as well. So a same poem can mean multiple things. Uh, because of this inherent nature of ambiguity. So ambiguity is the source of richness and source of multiple meanings of literary text rather than an obstacle or aberration of reason and logic. Any questions? So you have understood what I mean by ambiguity, right? If you are awake, that is. For example, all, all your presence that I can see in the attendee list is ambiguous because it says you are physically present, uh, but you are virtually present, right? And all of you are doing different things. social media film which I don't want to mention. Now, these ideas of ambiguity, referential and emotive views of language become and close analysis, explication of the text. Uh, all these things are uh, central to new criticism. The idea of new criticism basis upon. Uh, uh, that's that's why I know it's a demanding paper. Uh, and that's why not many people appreciate it. Logo poetry person nahi aati or criticism person nahi aata. Or ye do cheeze jaati hai to kya pasand aata hai kisko pata? Right. Okay. Yeah. And demand that criticism makes is uh, it makes forces you to think in abstract, logical, rational way something that we are not used to. We are used to thoughting. We are not used to thinking. Right? There is a difference between thoughting and thinking. Thoughting is what you do when uh, you sit on the commode and it goes on in your mind. Thinking is deliberative, focused, concentrated effort. And uh, that requires lot of practice and inclination to do that which don't, people don't like okay so these ideas by Empson and uh, uh, I.A. Richards form the core of uh, new criticism right so what we'll do, we'll look at F.R. Lewis and new criticism in the next class. Is that clear? Any questions about whatever we have discussed till now? No, sir, we'll read it up from Habib and I think even this topic. It has, Habib does different. not have this. Uh, uh, it has. Uh, on page 621. Yes. Are they paragraph? Right, but I Richards the ideas of the next let uh, entrance test sub ye what am am be next let entrance clear for the important thing. So if you are looking forward to uh, joining academics, then you have to clear these examinations. Next let get kind of thing, right? Pet, if you want to do PhD after your MA. Uh, 
but uh, and those are uh, very arbitrarily designed exams right okay so let's meet at 245 chalega so could we make it 3 please we rakh na kyun because sometimes madhuruta ma'am also continues until 2:30 2:35 okay then now you also continue till 12:45 so again she'll start at 1 right chalega to 3 baje milna hai yes sir okay chalo 3 baje milte hain yes Yeah. 